Thank you. <clears throat> so we got a half an hour. This is when I first put this talk together. It was a big topic, not just because it's mainframes, but it's a big area to talk about. Um, so first of all, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about myself, just so you understand a little more about me. I've been at ThoughtWorks 12 years, a principal consultant. I'm Canadian. I live on Vancouver Island. These are things that are in of interest to people, and uh, I've been working in the areas we talked about. But over, for over 10 years, I worked in rehabilitation with people with severe disabilities and worked in research before getting into IT. Um, I think experiences like that color the way I see the world and colors how I think about problems. So I think those sort of uh, bits of information are very important for people to understand. So, um, COBOL gets a bad rap. Um, these are very common quotes and how people feel about COBOL within our, the high-tech industry. We think, uh, you know, that we use the word legacy a lot. We don't like it. In fact, I get asked by uh, people in our company, they ask me things like, uh, why do you work in this area and why don't I do something useful? Um, and actually, I get questions like that, which throws me off. So people badmouth, especially green screen applications. Um, it kind of hit me one day, I was doing some Node.js work and VI uh, plugging along and I looked down and I realized that the VI editor that I love so much is a command line text editor written by Bill Joy in 1976. You know, and I, I realized right then that Frampton had just come alive in my command line. You know, so um, I'm not going to start bad mouthing uh, systems like mainframe systems or green screen systems because if it's durable and it's good, there might be something there. Um, there's the right way to build software. We all talk about it. You know, you got your test first, you got your CI, you got your integration working, your pipeline right through to production, ops is right in there, everybody's doing well. You know, you're Freddie Mercury at Wembley 1986. And that's, you know, how we all are. Is any, anybody in the room have a situation like that? That's what they're working in? If anybody put up their hand, I was going to make sure they bought drinks for everybody else in the room because I don't think that's the reality. Um, the point is, um, we talk about legacy systems, but if you think about Twitter and how many um, fail whales showed up uh, during the early days, was that suddenly a legacy application uh, because it wasn't doing what it meant to do? Was it fit for purpose is the question we should have been asking. So legacy has nothing to do with technology or platforms I'm discovering. Um, I'm going to talk about COBOL and why it's relevant in our world and why we should pay attention to it. That's uh, Google in 1999. Um, yeah, they're kind of nerdy back then, too. Um, COBOL systems, we can compare to the big things like Google and Amazon. These are big things. COBOL is big. I'm going to give you some stats, take them with a grain of salt, because it's difficult to quantify how big COBOL is in the world in mainframes. But Google is everywhere. I'll agree with that. However, it is estimated that 60 to 75% of the world's transactions happen on COBOL mainframe systems. Um, we use them every day. If you use a credit card, you're probably interacting with a COBOL system. If you sometimes go through traffic lights in major cities, you're probably talking to a mainframe somewhere. Um, if you're in insurance, if you are uh, getting a prescription filled, a good chance that you're dealing with a COBOL mainframe system somewhere underneath the covers. You might not see it. Um, I do about 10 to 15 searches a day, mainly for, you know, faux places and places that I can buy Thai food. Um, but the average American is estimated to uh, interact with a COBOL system 13 times a day. And we're talking about things like credit card transactions in banks. Um, Amazon recorded about 27 million sales in their last peak uh, holiday period. Google serves now over 5 billion searches a day. COBOL transactions account for 30 billion transactions worldwide. And that's a very conservative estimate. So these are big systems. They're part of our ecosystem. We live with them. And lastly, Google has hundreds of millions of lines of code. Um, it's estimated somewhere between 180 and 240 billion lines of COBOL are running in production today. Um, it's also estimated the average COBOL developer is supporting between two and five million lines of production code. So these are things we should care about. Um, if you're a little worried about that number, actually, that's kind of in line with C++ and Java numbers as well. That's the order of magnitude is quite large worldwide. So what does this mean? Um, what does this mean to us? First question is, why don't we replace these systems? Everyone says, let's just get rid of these systems. And replace them. I lost something. There we go. Why don't we just get rid of these systems? And you know, that's that's you know the strangler pattern is what we talk about. Well, let's just drop these systems. Let's put something in we like, something we enjoy. You know. Well, that's Lay Twins, by the way. If you search on Lay Twins and dance, you're going to see some amazing videos of these guys who dance. Um, replacing a COBOL mainframe system like for like is a problem. 
you're going to go and do a business case like this. I want to replace this with a technology I like. Let's suppose you're a Java guy. I'm going to replace it with Java, and I'm going to spend years doing this, and I'm going to spend a lot of money, and we're basically going to have the same thing we started with, except it's going to be in something I like. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to do a business case and get investment for something like that. Also, these systems cost, replacements cost tens of millions of dollars to billions. Uh, all you have to do is do a little research on how often people have tried to replace Sabre, and also look at the years of effort and the organizations and the businesses that have been stuffed trying to do this type of work. And lastly, there's a high likelihood of failure. Uh, the US Postal Service considered rewriting their COBOL-based system with 15 years of legacy information in it, as they called it then. They realized that was core business logic, and they just replatformed instead. Um, these large systems have decades of additions. Uh, there's workflows that are embedded into them and they're part of the DNA of a company. Um, and you spend hundreds of millions of dollars and you don't get a lot of return for replacing them. So mainly, especially in the fields of uh, finance and insurance, people don't replace these. And lastly, with these big integrated systems within companies, there's something called muscle memory that I think about with systems. Um, that's Martha Graham. I think she's universally considered to be the uh, 20th century's most important dancer, and she's the mother of modern dance to many people. She can do that movement because of muscle memory. She's trained over and over and over again, repetitious uh, movements, to eventually she has, can do them with, uh, without conscious effort. And in fact, if she dances while she thinks, then she actually can't do it. She has to let go, let her muscle memory take over, and she can do the dance. Years later, dancers can replicate uh, movements like that because of muscle memory. I think large enterprise systems like this imbue muscle memory into the companies that they're in, into the organizations they're in. Uh, the people have muscle memory from using it. Uh, teams have muscle memory from using it. And lastly, the whole organization's processes evolve organically with the systems over time. It's not just a matter of putting business logic in, but it changes the way information flows in the company, the way people communicate, and the way people talk. So if you're talking about replacing a large system like this, you have to think about that factor. And lastly, I've come to realize that legacy is a myth. Um, that was uh, UFO spotted over uh, Italy in 1960. Uh, apparently, it was to do with John F. Kennedy, the first Catholic pope, uh, no, the first Catholic president uh, you know, being uh, elected president, and the pope and the aliens somehow all coming together. So I think there's a lot of legacy there uh, as well. Um, but what I believe by myth is it really doesn't matter if you have COBOLs or mainframes, Java, AWS, Ruby on your stack. I think the question is, is it fit for purpose? Is this system doing its job and is it fit for purpose? And if the answer is yes, if the answer is truthfully yes, then the next question is, how do we invest in this system? And how do we take advantage of that? If it isn't fit for purpose, for whatever reason, then it's certainly a good time to replace it. But if it is, then we should invest in it. And if we're really very, very good at our CD practices, then we should become very good at bringing these uh, folks into the fold and bringing mainframes into the fold. So I've stopped using the word legacy. I think this is the heart of CD, growing the tent, making it bigger, and bringing other, other types of technologies, other types of thinking on board, and uh, improving. I'm going to talk about the Sun Simplification uh, Program. Sun, uh, Suncorp is a insurance company and bank out of Australia, and I was fortunate enough to work with them for about a year and a half before coming back to Canada and the US. Um, they have a strategy that's working. Um, they're evolving and they're improving their systems and their company uh, simultaneously, and they have a strategy around their mainframes. And it's working across their company, and they're getting uh, tangible rewards, and uh, their company is growing and prospering by that. So I'm going to talk about that experience. Um, by the way, this is a very subjective uh, measure. I just want to say that I'm uh, giving it my own personal view and my own personal story around this. There's, uh, I think, a lot more going to come of this. So there's a multi-year effort at Suncorp, what they're calling the simplification across banking and insurance. I was working on the insurance side, but overall they're investing $300 million over several years, and they're looking for a benefit of $225 million per annual in savings. That's a significant investment and a significant improvement. And in the insurance side, their, uh, their margins increased after the first year of the simplification program by, we're talking about in the neighborhood of 1% which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at the scale and the size of an insurance business, that is a number you want to pay attention to. Um, they also had um, an agile transformation building box program in place already. They spent several years working on culture. Many of their areas had learned around agile principles. So you go up to a business area, you go up to finance, you see cards on the wall, you see them having stand-ups you know, in the finance department. So they're, they're an interesting company that way because they've adopted the culture and they've adopted some thinking. 
not in all areas of the business and certainly not on the mainframe side yet, but they had adopted that throughout the company. So there's some skills in place, there's some values in place. And then they also worked very, very hard at this, uh, during the simplification program, not about replacing technology per se, but aligning around the customer and aligning around the customer experience. So a big part of this was uh, replacing their customer-facing systems, which are their online systems, and improving their processes for working with the customers internally. So it wasn't a matter of just changing a system and, say, getting some benefits, but they were looking at aligning their company around a particular goal. And lastly, they took on a strategy of saying, we're going to retire 14 systems, 14 uh, mainframe systems, and pick a uh, bet and bet on one system and invest in that. So if you look at the whole life cycle of explore, grow, sustain systems, and retire, they took one off sustain and moved it back to invest. And the rest of the systems are on track to be sustained and eventually discarded. So that is a very clear clear um, goal and a clear strategy that's working for them. Simplification, cleaning up, and alignment. There's nothing wrong with having a mainframe system. It's probably not good to have 15 of them. So that's what they were looking at. So this program is ongoing, and I was working on the program team as the test manager originally and working through the test plan. And the mainframe team uh, was running into some troubles in getting traction in this program. When you have hundreds of people working on a program, very complex, if you've ever worked in one of those big internal programs, and a lot going on, um, they were getting a little lost in terms of their ability to get going and get some traction. So I went down as delivery manager to work with them. And uh, when I showed up, we had about six to seven months to production and a feature hadn't been done yet. So things were a little bit, people were starting to get a little nervous. So I showed up and um, I was embraced and loved as soon as I walked in the door. Um, they uh, couldn't wait to see me. Um, and the reason why is uh, they were doing very well, thank you very much in many ways, and they've been doing very well for a lot of years, and suddenly this agile guy shows up. And you know they were wondering what was gonna happen. They were wondering what was going to occur. And one of the things I had to do right away was start to learn about listening and adapting. I didn't understand what a mainframe was. I didn't understand the culture there, and I didn't understand the way people think and talk about problems, so I had to listen very carefully. So why is this working? Why does a program like this work? Uh, this, these sort of, you know, has anyone worked on a program where you've had hundreds of millions of dollars, you've had hundreds of people working? Have you ever been involved with those? Um, they don't generally work. There's a very big failure rate in those types of uh, endeavors. So why did this work? First thing I'm going to talk about is organizational factors. Um, that's 1922 on a 22-story building standing on a, uh, standing on a uh, uh, something or other, two chairs anyways, and not much under them. So organizational factors, very much a balancing act. First of all, there's a clear direct business case. Um, I often see business cases that read like a Hercule Poirot novel, and I don't know who did it. Um, they're unfathomable, they're untenable. This one made uh, sense right from the get-go. It was approved by the board of their company in 20 minutes, and when you talked about the benefits and you talked about the direction, they got it right away. Everybody could align by it. So every team knew what the goals were. It wasn't like there was this vague thing to improve something or other. Very straightforward goals. The simple technology strategy was very clear. Moving to one system, a brand at a time. They have different brands. And also in refreshing the customer systems on top of it. So we had a new look for the customers and much more interactive uh, and much more uh, responsive systems. And then lastly, aligning on those with uh, uh, consolidated um, uh, processes and people-oriented processes within the company to be able to respond to customers. So very clear, very simple, very direct. Um, milestones were understood. Big milestones by product, by brand, and people understood what those looked like. And everyone understood what the measurement looked like on those. And lastly, the estimation when they started a program of this size, people often do, they come up with models, they come up with big spreadsheet models, they do a lot of forward calculations, they run Monte Carlo simulations, they do all sorts of things. They looked at past uh, large projects that worked and used that as the basis. They said, that's about our cadence to start with. They did the whole velocity measure, but more at a corporate level. And that was a very sensible thing to do. Um, the goals they set were very challenging. And um, they, they weren't easy goals, and the time frames were very aggressive, but they were all doable. And the question became, why can't we do them as opposed to why aren't we doing them? So moved ahead very quickly. 
Uh, there's shared values in the program, top to bottom. There's a shared leadership model, and people grew leadership skills within the program. It was key to find local leaders and grow them in their capability and support them. And the program team as a whole was focused very much on leadership as opposed to technical management. So we were expected to show uh, individual leadership. We were expected to reflect back to each other and learn leadership skills and imbue that into the people around us. So people were encouraged and brought forward to be leaders. Secondly, there was gender balance in this program top to bottom. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details around that, but any successful endeavor I've been in my life, there's gender balance within the organization and within the teams. And I've seen both sides of it. Being in the IT industry, it's easy for me to look at the old guy teams, but having worked in rehabilitation, I was often the only guy uh, in the teams in a very uh, female-dominated industry. I've seen both sides of that. And the thing that I've learned is gender balance across the board really helps, top to bottom. The delivery teams had gender balance. And they started with a lot of unknowns. There was a lot of risks there. They didn't say, we have to get everything known, and they didn't spend a lot of time trying to prevent risk. They, fin they spend time fixing problems as they come up and move on. Don't do it twice, but they, they spend a lot of time moving forward, taking steps and getting going in the right direction. You don't learn, you don't get better until you start walking. And they developed evolutionary strategies which means they tried things, and if they weren't working, they didn't beat themselves up. They moved to the next thing, and they tried something. If things were working and they were suddenly slowing down or they're not getting the metric returns, they would improve things, things like card walls, things like program walls, interacting with teams. The Scrum of Scrums whole process with uh, 20 teams was reworked, I don't know how many times, till we found something that worked. So it wasn't a matter of saying, this is the way we're gonna do it, that's our standard. There's a constant growth and exploration and trying to get better at things. Small incremental changes, measure each week and see how we're doing. And there's program alignment, business and customer alignment right from the get-go. Um, one of the problems was there was a clear separation often you get with these types of teams between the people who use the software, the people who support the software from a business point of view, and the teams writing software, especially in these large legacy style systems. So what we did is we brought them together and we put them in alignment. The people who are going to be supporting the software from the business point of view are also working with the people who would be supporting it from a technical point of view. Um, we uh, spent a lot of time measuring the management teams very, very closely. We measured them much more closely than we measured the delivery teams. Delivery teams are pretty good at self-evidence, but we started to measure the management teams much more closely in their performance daily and weekly. Uh, was the sort of granular level that we measured people's performance on. And it was very outcome-based. We didn't say you were 40 or 60% on a task, you were done or not done. It was a very much an outcome-based organization. And lastly, there's uh, mistakes. We're learning possibility. We're learning possibilities and we learn from them. Not, there was no problem making mistakes. Problem was doing mistakes a lot, not learning from them, not getting better. But if you didn't make mistakes, nothing was gonna happen. And there was a no-fault escalation uh, uh, policy there. And what I mean by that is teams needed decisions, teams needed help, and it didn't matter what it was. And if they weren't able to solve it, it, we encouraged, in fact, we spent a lot of time going through teams looking for problems and pulling them out and saying, we'll take that on from a management point of view. So some of those would be like, I need the CFO to make a decision in a company that size. Someone from the management team would take that on and they'd have a week to get it. It was very visible to the team who needed that decision made, what was going on with it, and daily that person was held accountable. Um, those types of, uh, and you know, it was nerve wracking because you'd have to stand in front of a lot of people every day and they'd say, how are you doing on that? Have you got that problem solved? Have you moved it along? And so we were pushed very hard to be accountable down and into the teams and across the organization. So personal accountability, a lot of responsibility, but a lot of support at the same time. So these aren't technical things, but these are things around changing the organization and the structure. And so the mainframe team, very conservative, came into this type of environment and started to respond. They started to change and they started to get much better because they were empowered. So I'm going to talk about some of the technical factors. Uh, that's the typewriter of the future in 1970. Um, I love the typewriter of the future. <laughs> Test strategies were key. This is uh, how you tested a football helmet in 1912. Um, if you're looking for direct and tangible feedback, um, this is one of my favorite pictures for that. So, test strategies. There was automation in place uh, already, some automation around some of the green screen parts of the application. That was there. So when I got to the mainframe team, I decided that we needed to invest more, and luckily we were able to take, make decisions around investment as, as a group. 
So we invested much more in test engineering, not so much in the functional testing, because these systems are relatively stable, relatively strong, but we invested in the risky areas, integration. We had a pricing system that we needed to integrate with that was uh, very challenging to integrate with because pricing and risk systems are finicky. Um, we also integrated with some of the uh, new systems, so all the new interactions with the website were all automated. And lastly, we supported a great deal of UAT, what people traditionally think of as UAT. So in the Agile world, we think about um, business testing early and often. We think about um, uh, um, testing individual stories and features. But a big part of this was testing the processes and the people and the readiness for production. We were able to run the company um, on, a, on this new platform and in this new integration. So we invested a lot of time in UAT. We gave automated testing tools to business testers. We let them run tests themselves. We let them record tests and say, we found a defect. I'm going to show it to you and share that around. Uh, we let them uh, feed back through those testing tools back into our test automation suite. So as things they were learning about the process and fitting it onto the new software system, we fed that back into the test cycles. We also used UAT as a way to see if the processes were working in correct alignment with the systems. We had to bring those two back together, and we had to see how usable the systems were and how people could work with them. Uh, we also supported training. We had to train 5,000 people in a month. And so we used our automation engineering to help support training, getting environments ready, get data ready, and we and put a lot of data into those systems. Um, we believed right from the get-go that the best testing is still done by people, by experts who are business people, experts who are technical people, and the automation supports those efforts. It doesn't replace it. You can bring up a high level of automation and then bring people up to a much higher level of testability and testing because people are very good at what they do. People are going to be the best judge of fitness. Uh, the business environments uh, were turned on as early as we could. This was painful, extremely painful with the mainframe system, with batch systems. But we did the effort and was worth it in the long run by a long shot. Uh, and lastly, we used exploratory testing uh, techniques in the large. We did mission-based testing for parts of the systems when we could. We taught exploratory testing uh, techniques to business people. Um, if I was going to teach a technique to high school students or teach uh, skills to high school students, I would teach exploratory testing techniques to them. And I'd sick them on uh, airline websites, let me tell you. And they could record things in Facebook. That would be, uh, that'd be fun. Defect management was um, a value that we set early. We realized that changing a business process or changing um, changing the way people worked with the system is a good solution to a defect or a gap. It isn't always a technical solution. So we worked on that together. And I would say over half the defects that we solved were through business process changes or training changes. If I could record more about that or get more metrics around on the program, I would have. And what we learned is that business decision, business decision makers became very sensitive to what was possible in a system. There was a virtuous cycle there and vice versa. So we had really good conversations. Instead of saying, how are we going to fix this? It was like, you probably can fix that, am I right? Or should we change it in the process? Or should we adjust together? We had very quick conversations, very meaningful conversations, because we understood each other's world much better. And lastly, the solutions were managed jointly with them. It wasn't this thing of saying, you know, we got the, we got the bug solved. It's, it's moving up through the stack. We uh, resolved it by making sure that people could use the system, they could be trained on it, and we could uh, manage our business processes on that. That was very important. It was the best uh, triage experience in 25 years for me. Environments. I'm going to pick up the pace here. Mainframe build pipelines don't exist. Uh, they're very difficult to do. We started with a very big release. We released early to production so we could make sure that things were working. This was new territory for us, releasing on the large. We released 47 systems into productions over a two-week period and over a million lines of code. The next step, though, we did right away was plan the next release and plan where we could automate based on the experience that we had. We found places to be able to deploy automatically, configure to, uh, automatically, and learn from that. And we started to get repeatable configurations. This had all been done manually. So we started to take steps in the right direction. You couldn't do it in the large, but we could start stepping in that direction. We learned from our manual processes. Uh, the manual process is the friend of you. And if you don't have to automate everything, you should look at those processes first. Think about improvement as your goal, continuous improvement in these systems and in your processes, analyzing. Uh, measuring work in progress and deploying it and then investing in the right places in automation. These are big systems to change into a continuous delivery world, so how do you start? Let's start in the small. Let's look at the manual processes and get very good at them. And testability. 
Um, that's the London Double Decker Bus Tilt Test. Now that's feedback for you, baby. Um, CD investment. We spent a lot of time and I learned something about language and understanding here. The team wanted to replace a key section of code that was funky. No other way to put it. We had a lot of technical debt in one area. They wanted to spend a lot of time improving that and on a very tight schedule, I was going to, on a six, on a, well, four months of test, uh, development, I was going to take the best developer we had and turn her loose for six weeks onto this problem. Um, and it was not a decision I was comfortable with because of the tight time frames we had. And I had to make a decision. The, the lead developer came up to me and he said, well, we're going to deploy it. It should work probably for most of the upcoming systems that we're uh, going to be working with. And we'll have new features there, but we don't have to turn the features on right away. And I went, bing. And I realized what they were talking about was feature toggling. And I'd been listening with the wrong ear. I'd been listening with uh, a prejudiced ear, if you will. And I realized what they're talking about by feature toggling, and I suddenly realized that is an easy decision for me. This is a good practice. It had to translate into another system how we thought about the problem, how we attacked the problem, but it was the same principle. And at that point, you said yes to it. And then you, you know, put plan B in place to make sure you got to your production. But that's something I learned was about listening in a, an environment that I was unfamiliar with. It was very difficult at first. We made integration testing easier. We got the QAs and devs to work together, logs, integration messages, data elements. We started to expose them. We made them easier. And we learned to trigger individual batch commands. If you ever worked with batch systems, they're the devil. And trying to uh, test batch commands are very, very difficult. So we learned how to trigger them independently. So what we did is we ring-fenced the system and the integration points and how we worked with the system, and we put testability all around that. We got a handle on this system, and then we started to spread out into the other systems. We attacked it that way. What did we learn about this? Uh, two minutes. The mainframe wants in. One thing I learned is that mainframe folks want into the continuous delivery world, and we need to invite them in, and we need to work with them, and we need to be positive about that. Don't evaluate legacy systems as legacy. Evaluate them as whether they are fit for purpose and whether they're worth the investment. If they are, bring them in. Recognize CD practices when you see them, even if they don't look like CD practices. Um, think about them differently. Think about your principles. Go back and question the way you think about things and adapt good practices into new areas. That's very important. Mainframe people are overflowing with ideas. It's a very conservative culture, but when you go in there and you start to work with them, you discover that they are keen to try things. They just haven't had an opportunity to do it. They have lots of good ideas, and they have a vocation towards their craft and their systems like everybody else here. And you have to encourage that and find those people and bring out those ideas in them. It's extremely important. You need clear business outcomes uh, when you're working with these large enterprise systems. You can't just go and say, I want to improve systems. You have to have a clear goal, measurable goal, and align to those. And you can get investment. You can get the virtuous cycle going. And lastly, if you're going to start anywhere working with these systems and working in CD practice, is I strongly encourage you to start in test practices. Certainly, uh, things around build, configuration, deploy, and other types of uh, activities are very important. But I would start looking at those as work in progress, improvements, but I would invest heavily in test engineering right out of the gate. I think it's the best approach, and it gives you the most, uh, the most uh, bang for the buck. So I have a minute left, um, or two. Is that correct? Is yeah, it in there? Two or three minutes. Yeah. Two or three minutes. Well, if someone's got a question, they can put their hand up. What I'm going to do is just to show, do a quick technical uh, look here. One of the perceptual filters I had was around GUI automation. I don't like GUI automation. I think it's a bad thing to do. Just that's my prejudice coming in. What we found out is that green screens are durable. Green screens are very fast, and they are very, they have a, a lot of strengths around GUI automation. So you're going to see a little um, test running here. I'm going to run that, and what you're going to see here is a demo. There's a couple little mistakes in it, but that's okay. The green screens are remarkably durable and remarkably quick, and I found this to be an incredibly good testable endpoint. So they're kicking off a little test here, and this is actually going through an amazing number of workflows. Um, this is creating a new company. This is uh, and creating new um, um, new uh, contracts for that company. Um, that generally takes uh, an analyst about 10 minutes to do, 15 minutes to do. And what we discovered through this was that green screens are amazingly fast and amazingly durable, not just, like, not just the systems themselves, but testing them is very fast. So what's going on in the bottom is jobs are running, and they're waiting for the jobs to run, and then they're kicking off batch jobs to run in the background, 
which is quite remarkable. So what we were doing was for supporting UAT testing, because we had this type of capability, we could set up 500 to 1,000 policies anytime we wanted for UAT to run. We could set up uh, training environments with thousands and thousands of policies for people to learn from. But what we found, and we use Concordian, so I'm going to stop it right there. Um, this is just an example of some of the Concordian output. But I was very surprised that GUI test works so well on a mainframe environment. Uh, we, we didn't uh, think it would, but we put a lot of time into the test engineering and working with the system to make it work properly. So when you look at through those systems and that type of speed, um, you need to work with the strengths of the mainframe system. And the testability and the testing of the mainframe system can be done in different ways and the automation can be done in different ways. Normally I wouldn't attack a system through a GUI, but I learned that the programs and the GUIs are very well aligned to each other and they're building blocks on each other. You can take a program and a GUI screen and put them together and build them into very virtuous blocks of testing. So it was quite something. So anyways, I'm sorry I didn't set that up properly in the slide. I'm uh, Terrible at slides, obviously. And I've run over my time. So if you want to catch me in the hallways and to talk, I'd be happy to talk with you more. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.